Oh, hear you, the fellowship of the faithful. Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin. You did not cover over my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with the songs of the deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must con be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad. You righteous sing, all you who are upright in heart. The word of the Lord. Today we're talking about confession. Not the confession that Jesus is Lord, though that's obviously incredibly important. We're talking about confessing our sin. Not just confessing our sins to God, which is the way most of us like to do that if we do it at all. No, we're talking today about confessing our sins to each other. We're in the middle of a series on the church. What is the church? What does she do? What's her role in the world? What does that mean for the community of faith? We talked about prayer last week, and we're going to continue talking about prayer as we go forward. Prayer is the foundation for what we do as the church. Now, I don't always understand prayer, and you may not either. But I'm constantly learning to trust Jesus more and more. And Jesus prayed a lot. So I want us to pray right now before we enter into our discussion on confession. Let's pray. Father, you are holy. May we be people who embody your will. Shape us into your instruments. Teach us to follow the spirit you have given us. Forgive us as we forgive. Deliver us. As we enter your living word today, may our lives and actions reflect your story. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the sermon's going to have three parts today. We're going to look at some examples of confession in the Bible. We're going to go over some outcomes of confession, and then we're going to practice confession. I know that might sound a little scary and not like what we usually do during service, so I wanted you to have some time to prepare yourselves. Because <laughs> the truth is, confession is sort of scary. If I confess my sins to you, it may change the way you think about me. Well, good. None of us needs to make an idol out of someone else here. None of us needs to think we're holier than anyone else here either. We are the children of God. We are in the image of God. We have all betrayed God. We are dearly loved by God. So we confess to each other. If you want to look at a text, turn to 2 Samuel chapter 12 or Psalm 51. You know the story. David stays home when he should have been gone. He lusts when he should have turned away. He abuses his power to commit adultery. He abuses his power to commit murder. Then Nathan the prophet comes and tells him a story about a lamb dearly loved by its poor owner. But the greedy rich neighbor steals it and feeds it to a guest. Horror, anger, you are the man. Nathan says to David. David could have denied it, but instead he says in 2 Samuel 12, verse 13, I have sinned against the Lord. 
perhaps a forced confession. Maybe we think he sinned against more than just the Lord. But David, when confronted with his sin, no longer tries to cover up what he's done. Instead, he confesses before God to Nathan. Nathan imparts the Lord's forgiveness, which you'll note does not stop consequences. And then in Psalm 51, David says something that I find interesting. He says a lot of things I find interesting. But look at verses 12 and 13. David asks not only for forgiveness, but for the joy of salvation to be restored and for a willing spirit to sustain him. Once restored and sustained, his purpose moves to teaching others who have sinned. He says, and I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. 3,000 years later, David's sin and restoration are still teaching tools. I think God granted the request. In Nehemiah 9, we see an example of corporate confession, which will be something we practice today. For background, Ezra and Nehemiah are about the return from exile in about 500 BC. At this point in the story, the temple and the wall have been rebuilt, and now the people of Israel are taking time to adjust back to life in their ancestral land. But the problems of generations, idolatry, marrying foreigners, neglecting the law, unjust practices, all these things have led to their punishment time and time again. And so in chapter 8, Ezra reads from the law, and the people can hardly stop from weeping because they realize how much sin has gone before them and how much still surrounds them. Starting in chapter 9, verse 1. On the 24th day of the same month, the Israelites gathered together, fasting and wearing sackcloth and putting dust on their heads. Those of Israelite descent had separated themselves from all foreigners. They stood in their places and confessed their sins and the sins of their ancestors. They stood from where they were and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day and spent another quarter in confession and in worshiping the Lord their God. After this, the rest of the chapter breaks down their confession, and I would recommend you take a look at it. In chapter 10 and following, the people commit to changing what was wrong with very practical steps. This passage is so interesting because in between the mourning of sin and the fixing of the wrongs, the people recognize they have to confess their sin. They confess before God and before each other. Everyone is culpable, and because of that, they can stop ignoring what's wrong and move forward. The last story is a familiar one. It's so one I'm co-opting a little bit, but I think the point about confession is still there. In Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14, Jesus tells the parable to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else. And I suppose that could apply to anyone who thinks they don't need to confess their sins. The Pharisee flaunts his credentials to God but the tax collector enters into his shame and comes out justified. Jesus says that those who humble themselves will be exalted. Confession takes humility. Okay. We see that people in the Bible confess. Why do they confess? Why should we confess? This is an exhaustive list, but three is sort of the number. So I've selected three things. First, confession creates space for relationship. David was able to continue his deep relationship with God once this sin was in the open. The people of Israel were able to move forward as a community. You'll find that when you confess your sins, it pulls back the curtain. If I hide a part of myself from you, you will always be unable to fully know me. It's not that we're proud of our sins, but the honesty we share with each other will deepen our bonds. It allows us to share our burdens as a community. Galatians 6, 1 through 3 talks about this. It says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. A lot of depth enters into our relationships when we share our burdens. This verse also talks about some risks when hearing confession, and that's another topic. Things like using confession to have power over someone, or all the stories about affairs that start when someone is confessing the problems at home. Be careful of those kinds of things. While we're kind of on a tangent, 
Confession and mental health aren't the same thing either. This is in here because my wife told me I needed to put this in here. Unless your minister is a licensed mental health professional, there are things you should probably talk about with a therapist, counselor, someone with a degree and license in those fields. That does not mean ministers in the church can't or shouldn't be involved in coping or healing, but the body has many parts with many functions and some people are more equipped to handle certain things. I am not a trained mental health professional, but we have a few in this congregation. I'm sure one of them can direct you somewhere if you have questions. PSA. All right. right, so back to the three points. Confession creates space for relationships. Confession also, and probably most obviously, leads to forgiveness. Once David confesses, Nathan tells him the Lord has forgiven him. The tax collector was justified and exalted before God after his confession. Jesus doesn't specifically say forgiven, but if you read the text, you know Jesus loved forgiving people. So I think it's safe to read that there. Near the close of James, which by the way is a super tough book, read through that and see if you have anything to confess. James says in chapter 5, verses 13 through 16, is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. James places forgiveness for sin and confessing to each other right there together. Think about it this way. If I pray to God and ask for forgiveness, I believe that God forgives me. That's good and true and important. If I go further and I confess that sin to a brother or sister as well, that person can not only help bear the burden, but like Nathan did to David, they can offer me God's forgiveness. We know that God forgives those who ask. We can tell each other that when we sin and we confess. Unlike responding with, well, that's a bad one, or, oh, I've been there, or you did what? We have the opportunity to say, the Lord has taken away your sin. That's powerful. Just like with David and Israel, that doesn't mean there aren't consequences for sin. The people of Israel were still under the rule of foreigners and dispersed so much that some tribes never truly returned. But we need to walk with each other through the consequences. Uh, but confession is a time for forgiveness. Consequences come later. Confession also leads to freedom. Last week we talked about the apostles' boldness which came through prayer. They were bold because they were of one heart and mind pushed on by the power of the Holy Spirit. If we are hiding sin, if part of our goal when we are with our brothers and sisters is to keep something dark inside of us hidden, we cannot be of one heart and mind, and we are fighting the Spirit. But if there is nothing to hide, then we never worry about what could be revealed. Think about the political madness going on right now. We've already talked about that a couple of times during the service. There's always some scandal popping up. Something someone did that gets revealed with the extra scrutiny on their campaign. For some candidates, that can destroy their credibility and make them have to completely drop out of the race. We all have sin in our lives. There's no pride in that, but there's also no reason to keep that hidden. The Israelites confessed their sin together, then in unity, chose to change and follow God with the care their ancestors neglected. We too can choose to be free from hiding sin and instead choose as a community to face our sins and let God destroy them and shape the pieces into new ways to further his kingdom. So let's confess. We're going to engage in two kinds of confession this morning. The first is corporate confession. This looks more like what Israel did in Nehemiah. We are all going to confess sin together. Why are we confessing together? Because there are things that we all do, things we are all complicit in, things we can all relate to. This is confession before each other, and it is confession before God as the church. 
This is the kind of confession that does not hard our part, hide our part in systemic or communal wrongs, but recognizes that we, to quote Isaiah, all like sheep have gone astray. So here we go. I want everyone to stand up, because when you confess, you stand. You're going to follow along with the PowerPoint. This is going to be a long reading. We're going to do a lot of reading in unison together. Uh, follow the slides. I'm going to read the ones that say leader at the top, and it's going to be a big chunk that says congregation in the middle. Here we go. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not have the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. All right, join me. Oh God, when we pause to look back at our lives today, we realize that we have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. We have neglected to do good when it was in our power to do so. We, like believers of old, have pulled down your altars and erected idols crafted in our own image. We have turned our backs on the poor, choosing instead to criminalize poverty. We have ignored the cries of the motherless, the fatherless, the widow, and the widower, choosing instead to turn children and the elderly into the new poor. We have bankrupted the country with our greed and consumed more than our share of the world's riches. We have not dealt honorably with our enemies or our friends, and we have feigned a place in the company of the righteous. Forgive us, O oh God, for turning sackcloth and ashes into a fashion statement by pursuing form without substance. Forgive us, O oh God, for the times we have neglected to provide our children and our world with an exemplary example of Christianity. Wash us, O oh God, and we shall be clean. Cleanse us, O oh Lord, and we shall be made whole. Amen. The Lord our God is gracious and merciful slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. God hears the earnest cries of the repentant and forgives our sin. You can be seated. I hope you felt the power of God in that confession. Together we recognized our guilt and God offered us forgiveness. We allowed things we try not to think about to come to the surface and we spoke them out loud in the place we should most be talking about these things. Instead of hiding, we can choose to move forward now together as one body. We all are part of those sins and we all are forgiven and we can all move forward. Confession's important. Confessing our personal sin is also important. We're about to take a minute now to confess specific things to each other and I want to prepare us for that. I'm asking for everyone in this room to confess a sin to someone else. Yeah, out loud. Mm -hmm. This can be whatever you feel the need to confess. For me right now, I'm feeling guilty because I almost daily will ignore someone who's asking for my help. I work downtown, in Philly. There's people all over the place always asking. I wear headphones when I walk around, and there are many days when I pretend like I can't hear people when I'm walking past them. And it's not right. It's not right. Um, I don't want to look them in the eyes, because if I do that, then I'll have to remember that they're people created in the image of God. When someone offers you their confession, this is what I want you to say. The Lord has taken away your sin. That's it. Not I've been there or that's tough or woe or anything else. Just say, the Lord has taken away your sin. Say it with me. The Lord has taken away your sin. I don't know exactly how this is gonna work, but we're gonna try it. So what I want everyone to do is find someone around you, I want you to confess, and then I want the, the person who's hearing the confession to say, the Lord's taken away your sin. Okay? Any questions? We got it? Go.
The Lord our God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. God hears the earnest cries of the repentant and forgives our sin. We are a forgiven people, and because of that, confession always ends in thanksgiving. We are thankful because we have an opportunity to move beyond our sin to the places where God is calling us. I told you during the confessions to not say anything besides the Lord has taken away your sin. That was for that moment. I encourage you to follow up with the person who confessed to you after service. We can't carry each other's burdens if we hear a confession and then ignore what we heard. I believe that all of us who have chosen Jesus, we want to become more like Christ. So I believe that if you confess to sin, it's because you want to heal. So your homework after this is to follow up with each other so we can be a church that does not stop at confession, but that moves toward holiness. And now the invitation. If you've not experienced the forgiveness of God and want to be baptized, come join the family of God today. If you have more sin burdening you, something that felt too painful to reveal, but you know you can't carry it any longer, come down or find someone to talk to right now. Whatever is going on with you, answer Jesus' call to come as we stand and sing.